What's up, everyone? Back with another session of Reimagining the City, this time recorded on the ground in Dorrington Park in Ashgrove. I'd like to start by acknowledging country and paying respects to Yagara and Terrible peoples, recognizing that sovereignty was never ceded and that there are many past wrongs and continuing injustices that are yet to be rectified. This is a bit of a special session because Senator Maureen Faruqi, the Australian Greens deputy leader, came up to Brizzy for the weekend. And so we managed to squeeze in a bit of a chat in the park, talking about colonialism and imperialism and the struggle for a better world. The discussion went for about 40 minutes or so, and we've unpacked some really cool issues. So yeah, that's what you're about to listen to. Enjoy. Thanks for making this space happen, Quintessa, and to all her team who pulled this together at fairly short notice. Yeah, hi, I'm Jonathan Sriranganathan. I think I know most of you. It's a pleasure to have Maureen here with us in the park. I don't think Ashgrove has ever hosted a talk called Colonialism and Imperialism, The Struggle for a Better World before, but it's uh, obviously a really good topic to be exploring this weekend. And just to build on Quintessa's acknowledgement country, we also want to pay our respects to Yagara and Turbul peoples, recognize that sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, and I guess for a bit of context, like one of the reasons I wanted to hold this discussion today was partly because Marine was in town and we could have had a conversation about public transport or a conversation about renters' rights or about the great work you've done with like greyhound racing and animal rights stuff. Um, Marine is across so many important issues, but given um, the timing and the fact that this is just after Invasion Day, I thought it was particularly important to center those conversations but also to highlight that, you know, on, on Invasion Day, everyone's talking about this stuff. And then the day after we go on with the rest of life and we sort of, it drops off the radar again. So I kind of wanted to say, hey, this is something that we need to be thinking about every day of the year and not just on the 26th of January. And I also wanted to acknowledge that right now, this is me, me and Maureen chatting and that we don't have any First Nations people up here on on the mic and just want to acknowledge any First Nations people in the room. But I also think it's important that uh, non-Indigenous people and allies are making space for these conversations without uh, demanding that First Nations people give their time to educate us ev for every single event. And so in saying that, like, we need to be mindful of the voices that aren't represented up here on the microphone and that we're speaking sort of from our own insights and experiences, but that obviously different people will dif bring different lenses and critiques to this stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think it is important to be mindful of our subject positions and, yeah, who's not here in the conversation and who's not here on the microphone. But, uh, yeah, having said all that, uh, I'm really excited about this conversation, particularly because I just want to pick Maureen's brain. And um, we've, you know, we've all seen what's been happening in Palestine at the moment and, um, how awful this ongoing genocide in Gaza has been. And at the same time, thinking deeply about the experiences of First Nations people on this continent, but also about the experiences of people all around the world who've been on the end of the, on the receiving end of colonialism and imperialism. And so the first question I was kind of going to pose to Maureen and open up the discussion around is um, there is a lot of direct connection between the experiences of what's happening with people in Palestine and what's First Nations of pe people have been through on this continent. Um, do you want to sort of talk us through these threads of imperialism and colonialism and, and how they all intersect? And thank you for being here as well. Please welcome Maureen to the microphone. Thank you, Jono, and thank you, Quintessa. Thank you, everyone, for being here in this seat. Um, and I've, whenever I've come to Mianjin, I've been so warmly welcomed by you all, and it is such a privilege to represent you in Parliament. But I, too, want to acknowledge the sovereign owners of the lands we gathered on and pay my respects to elders past and present, because no matter where we are in this country, we are on stolen land. Sovereignty was never ceded. This is, always was, and always will be First Nations land. And particularly, as both Quintessa and Jono said, in, um, you know, yesterday was Invasion Day and, you know, once again, a very stark reminder of the violent colonialism um, that happened in this continent and how it's still ongoing, frankly. And I think that's really what I want to touch on as well, that you might think that, you know, even when, I mean, I grew up in Pakistan, so the British left there a while ago, about 76 years ago, but the repercussions of colonialism don't leave the places um, that colonialism happens in. So I think Arundhati Roy called, explains in some ways the, you know, the, the corporate influence of imperialism that still remains, which is the, you know, the outposts of the British Empire is how she calls it. So I'll come back to that, but I think First Nations people understand better than any of us 
what the Palestinians are going through at the moment, because it's pretty similar stories of lives lost, livelihoods lost, loss of land, um, dispossession. Um, and I think one of the things I think about very deeply when we talk about imperialism and colonialism and how it manifests on people of color, um, you know, by, I guess, white people mostly around the world, is the dehumanization of the people that are colonized or the dehumanization of people which are still kind of where imperialism still strikes at the heart. Um, and that is exactly what is happening in Palestine. You know, they're being called pretty much not humans or subhumans. The way 25,000 people have now been killed and there's thousands more who are un unaccounted for, which includes more than 12,000 children now. And still, and still, Western countries have not batted an eyelid or, you know, haven't even called for Israel to be held account for any of those. Just tells you how deep the tentacles of, I guess, white supremacy, colonialism and imperialism, um, you know, kind of are embedded in, in, in the world that we live in today. And it's exactly the same situation for First Nations people. The way, like we've already had two deaths in custody, um, I think in the last few months. And that just keeps going. The incarceration keeps happening. Um, you know, we still haven't changed the laws on um, how, um, you know, young people are put into prison. So, and, and there's so much more, you know, land is still being destroyed. Water is still being destroyed. So I guess that, how, how do we get, how do we move forward in making sure that we somehow stop this from happening? And I don't think we have been successful, you have to agree. I don't know, Jono, what you think, but I don't think we have been successful, frankly, um, in addressing, um, you know, kind of the impacts of colonialism, let alone kind of changing the system that causes this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have some ideas, but I'd like to hear from you where, like, what do we do? What do we do? We've been, like, trying our best, pushing in parliaments and, I guess, talking to people on the streets, joining rallies, for instance, for many, many decades, um, you know, with First Nations people, with um, Palestinians and, and their allies. And, you know, I can tell you, I've been in rallies for the last 15 years, at least, in Australia. So the one thing I have seen that has changed this time around is the number of people that are, who have eyes wide open now, I have to say. Because I've, not long ago, I think it was six years ago, I was at a rally, al Nakba rally, where there were like literally 20 people, mm, yeah. 20 people there. And now every weekend, there are thousands and thousands across the country. So that has changed. How do we then move that momentum into actually some material change for the people who are who are being massacred at the moment mm. in uh, Palestine and here. Yeah, such such good thoughts, Marine. And I think for me, like one of the things I keep coming back to, or that I think our critical examination needs to start with, is recognizing our own complicity and how we're all co-opted into being complicit in this stuff. Because um, we all benefit from col colonialism and, and imperialism, and um, we are all sort of responsible to some degree for pushing back against that system but there's always a little bit of a funny mismatch where we're like oh yes isn't this terrible this is still happening we need to do something about it but then we kind of go on with our lives as normal and and we're like oh this is just this is something happening but I'm just going to keep going to work and or you know keep campaigning for elections like there's a certain um it it, it quickly becomes background noise and that's one of the features of the Australian colonial nation state project is that um the entire nation is founded on this stuff. So as soon as you start paying close attention and thinking, okay, how do we push back against this stuff? You have to unravel everything and you have to transform everything about our society. And I, I guess it's maybe before I jump to the, oh, how, what else should we be doing about this? I, I think I wanted to unpack a little bit more what we mean by these words, colonialism and imperialism, because they get thrown around a lot. And I think they mean different people, different things to different people. And when we get to the q and I'm sure we'll hear other viewpoints and, and questions about this stuff. But um, for me, one of the like f striking features of imperialism is it's not always just a country saying, hey, we want to expand our control and have these client states, you know, that old school Roman Empire kind of thing. Um, 
imperialism can also be enacted through um, multinational or like um, international allegiances and can also be enacted through the corporate sector, right? Like um, these big multinational corporations that are hand in glove with governments, that's sort of the new imperialism. It's not just nation states expanding or taking control or seeking to manipulate. It's companies and nation states working together and playing off each other. And we see that like, you know, Gaza in and what's happening in Palestine is in some senses a war for oil, right? That's that's one piece of the puzzle is that you've got companies that there's there's gas reserves off offshore off Gaza. There's, you know, this is um, valuable non-renewable resources that different companies and nations want to grab hold of. Uh, it's also obviously a war for land, and um, and but it's also being driven in part by the military-industrial complex and companies that uh, they want they want to create a need for weapons so that they can sell more weapons. So they they're creating wars and manufacturing wars in order to be able to create demand for their their weaponry. And then they're also able to then sell that weaponry and say, look, this is battle tested. We tried these these missiles out on the on the Palestinians. So now you want to buy them too because you know they're going to work. Um, so there are all these different threads that kind of drive that project of um, imperialism. I, I don't know if we – like do you draw a difference between – colonialism and imperialism are they two different things because like for me colonialism is often where you're trying to actually set up a colony like and that's what israel's doing right it's not just um taking over a place it's actually trying to displace people and and establish its own settlements there but do you want to unpack that yeah no i agree with you i mean they're very much interconnected yeah. but i think it there is that difference and i guess imperialism is a little bit more subtle mm. in a sense and it I feel exactly like you, that it is about exploitation and extraction. That's what imperialism is basically about. And you talked about the military-industrial complex. I'll talk about the aid-industrial complex because that is so tied together with how um, countries that, that, you know, the Western nation purports to aid, um, the reason is not to actually, um, I guess, repair the damage that has been done to those countries because of our actions, whether it's actions on, you know, the impact or the proportion that we have, uh, you know, created climate change from, for instance, or, or because of the wars, the impact that those countries have faced because of the wars that we have been part of. Uh, it's not about that at all. It is about the national interest, right? It is about what we can get out of those. And by, when I say we, I mean also the corporations that are implicated in that we. Um, so I think that's a, that's a huge part of the picture when we talk about, as Greens, you know, increasing aid. It's not just about increasing aid. It's actually about completely reimagining what that means in, um, in terms of decolonizing aid. Because it is, it is not a charity. Aid is not charity. Aid is righting historic wrongs. It's about reparation for the damages that we have done. But that is not it. Like you look at what's happening in PNG, you look at you know other places. It's done in in and pretty openly, frankly, so that you know other countries like China don't get control mm. of um, you know those completely kind of overruling, undermining the sovereignty of the indigenous people there. Um, so I think. Um, when we do things, and this is exactly, it comes back to what you were talking about, John, or the system, the machine of the system. Um, and, and how do we even think about, there are so many elements to that machine that it is overwhelming. I agree, it is overwhelming. Where do we start and where, where do we end? But we have to keep in our mind always that it is the system that we are railing against. It is somehow that system that needs to be changed. Otherwise, these things will just continue on. And, you know, one example I often think about is how, you know, because of the climate crisis, we want to move from one kind of energy system, which is the fossil fuel-based system, to renewable energy. But I, I feel that what we completely neglect in that scenario is, is not just moving from one energy source to another, but actually changing the way that energy is created and delivered. If we don't do that, the exploitation of workers, the exploitation of human rights, uh, for example, you know, where lithium is mined or where other elements are mined, it's still kids mining those things that we, you know, want to use as renewable energy. I, I just see that it's a totally missed opportunity if those systems of energy production 
are not changed. Yeah. And those systems, you know, actually help workers, um, you know, stop the exploitation of workers. I mean, you, you look at companies like BlackRock, for instance, you know, big asset manager investing in renewable energy, but still, on the other hand, building this huge pipeline for gas through indigenous land. I mean, that's useless. If we don't change those systems, the money and the, the, corp the benefits are just going to flow from one corporation to the other, and nothing changes for everyday people. So I want us as the Greens to pay a lot more attention to not just moving from one energy source to the other, but actually look underneath to see how we move from one to the other. Yeah, I, I, I think that's such a good point. And, and as you say, right, if we don't focus on this stuff, um, we end up just reinforcing other forms of injustice in the name of sustainability. And in the name, like, and we end up with sort of forms of green colonialism where, yeah, we're extracting minerals from indigenous land so that we can build our batteries. And uh, yeah, it's uh, so many threads to this, as you said. I, the other one that sprang to mind while we were talk, you were talking then was um, the way modern Australian colonial like I, I use the term um kind of colonial imperialism to describe australia because it is a settler colony in that the british and other european nations came here and displaced first nations people and so it's, it's sort of that kind of classic settler col colony in a way but it, it is also an imperial power in terms of how australia projects influence into southeast asia and the pacific and so australia is acting like an empire as well trying to influence the politics of island nations around us and sometimes supporting quite despotic regimes you know like australia's re relationship with indonesia sort of allows indonesia to continue to suppress the west papua people where like importing um timber and other resources that have been extracted from West Papua and then we're paying Indonesia to sell us that stuff so that we could, yeah, it's really interesting to start thinking about Australia as being both a colony and an empire. Um, but the, the thread I wanted to bring into this was that nowadays Australia, um, it's, it's almost like we want the benefits of globalization, but we don't want the, you know, obviously we don't want the, to deal with the consequences of that or um, rectify the injustices that flow from that. And so we really want the cheap manufactured products that are made overseas. Um, we want the benefits of that sort of uh, unskilled or uh, it's not unskilled, but low paid labor um, in for foreign countries. But then we also want those countries to spend a lot of their resources educating, say, doctors, and then the doctors come here to, to look after us. So that's another element to me of colonialism and imperialism is like that brain drain where other countries, they put all this money and resources into their education systems, they educate people to become skilled professionals, and then we offer them skilled migrant visas, and then they come here and we get the benefits of that person that another country has spent 20 years educating. And so we're, we're extracting the cheaply manufactured goods and exploiting those low paid workers. We're also extracting the highly educated professionals from other parts of the world and we're bringing them here. But we don't want to bring like, you know, maybe the doctor wants to bring over their elderly parents. We don't want to give them a visa or like um, maybe that doctor has a relative who's disabled. We don't want them to come here and be a, a quote unquote burden on our welfare system. So there are these interesting threads there of like, we're trying to have all the benefits of this stuff. And, and I highlight this just to remind people that we are really as a as a nation and as a society really benefiting from this injustice. It's not just something that's sort of passively happening in the background, our immigration policies, our, yeah, our work for, for our approach to managing Australia's workforce and like how much we put into localized education versus how much we, we focus on bringing people in from overseas. And it's complex because then you have these layers of um, migrants who in some ways are being exploited, but are also the beneficiaries of colonialism themselves. And, um, I'm sorry, I'm rambling a little bit now, but I wanted to ask you, Maureen, about how you engage with that question of complicity because um, we are, you know, people of color and like my father's from um, Tamil Ilam or from Sri Lanka and um, Sri Lanka has definitely been on the receiving end of colonialism from the Portuguese and then the Dutch and then the British and there's a really long history there that we could go into. Um, so we've got that lived experience and I would argue that the... Um, the Sri Lankan civil war and the factors that led to so many Tamil people having to emigrate as refugees, etc., are all ultimately creations of the British. So the British created this problem, turned people against each other. Then there's a massive civil war. Like, um, 
so we have that history of kind of some some form of oppression, but then we also benefit from colonialism. And sometimes there's a risk that non-Indigenous people of colour are taking up a lot of space in this conversation or are too easily innocent in ourselves where we're like, yeah, we identify with First Nations people. Their struggle is our struggle. Um, but then we sort of flatten out the fact that we're also beneficiaries of and complicit in colonialism. I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. I think it is like it, like layers upon layers of complexity there. I guess the first point is to be to be aware of that complicity. I think that's the starting point. But before I go into that, I do want to touch on what you said earlier about the skills and the skill, because I was one of those skilled uh, engineers who, who got a permanent residency to Australia because I was an engineer. My husband was an engineer. And we were told Australia had a real lack of engineers and these you know skills were needed and there were reasons uh, why we wanted to move out of Pakistan, some to do with discrimination, some to do with corruption. Um, but when we got here, there was literally nothing for us. There were no jobs. No one would give us a look in. Um, like there was impossible to open the door. So, you know, my husband started to drive a taxi. And there are so many people like us who, um, engineers with masters, with PhDs, could not get a job because we didn't have local experience. No one would give us local, like how do you get local experience when you, you asked us to come here? And yeah. um, so it's, it's, all, it's really tricky and a lot of them are still driving cabs, you know? So it's really crazy that the, the place where we come from loses out. And Australia, like this country, loses out as well because you've got all these people. And we're still, you know, kind of arguing the same thing. You know, now, 30 years on from when we came, there's a lack of engineers, we're told. And so we need to get skilled engineers, skilled migrants over here. And I hope that things might be different for them um, than they were for so many that came at the time um, that, that we came. But I think that there is, I have to say, from communities where, um, like mine in Australia, in this, you know, there there is a lack of awareness of, you know, how we are part of the settler colony as well. There really is. Um, so I think those of us who are a little bit more aware, probably, I mean, I start those conversations um, because, as you said, like many of us have kind of endured, I guess, the the, the violence of colonization as well and. In some ways, we can then understand better what First Nations people are going through. Um, but I think um, in, in other ways, we also feel that, you know, kind of we have a right to have a better life as well kind of thing. So, listen, it, it, it's tough. It is tough. I guess the, we have to show solidarity with First Nations people. What shape and form that solidarity takes um, might look different for every one of us. Um, but we, like, you know, I mean, one of the things... Um, that I often talk about is providing space for First Nations people. Um, so for me, when I started in Parliament, we started a like a you know a Women's Day um, event, which was just for providing voices to First Nations people, women, um, and women of colour. And that ten years on, and you know, there's many people who, and I'm not taking credit for, uh, you know, them now having a big platform. But there were many people who ha are now have through, you know, not through that, but have a big voice now. So, you know, smaller opportunities sometimes lead can lead to to big things as well. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't always have to be you at the forefront of everything. And you know, that event has 200, 220 people um, every week, and a vast majority of them are women of color and First Nations women. So, you know, I, I think it's important to keep in mind in our work how we, can, how we can do that. But that's only like a small thing. You know, if we are, if we have a capacity and a platform like I do, then we have to use every opportunity to be able to do that. Otherwise, it's a waste of that platform that you have, frankly. Yeah. Well said. Um, I, I feel like maybe this is a good, have, have some water, it's so hot. <laughs> um, um, yeah. Bundaberg ginger beer. Um, welcome to Queensland, Maureen. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe this is a good time to start thinking more about what the Greens are doing and what more we could be doing. Because, I mean, to the party's credit, we've we've come out pretty strongly in terms of Palestine. But I do think we were also still a little bit slow to actively use the word genocide and and say hey there's a genocide like i i don't even know I yeah you yeah uh, me neither um but i guess like there's there's that obvious stuff of like 
calling things out and speaking up about this stuff. Um, do you want to briefly sort of tell us a little bit more about what else the Greens party room has been doing that we might not have seen or might not be aware of? Um, not just in terms of Palestine, but in terms of some of these other issues we've touched on, like exploitation of migrant workers and obviously the persecution of refugees is something that the Greens have been speaking out about for a while. But yeah, kind of open open platform to be like, well, here's what we have been trying. <laughs> Um, yes, so I guess a lot on Palestine, and I think one of the biggest thing is again showing solidarity with the people out there marching on the streets. So a lot of our, um, you know, Greens members, Greens supporters, Greens MPs, councillors have been out every weekend. I know I have, whether I'm speaking at a rally or not. You've, you know, you've got to provide support. Um, and and for me, like I know the community very well in New South Wales. So it is not about just kind of being front and center of it but providing support through phone calls you know I, I know my friends have called me up and just literally the conversation is all crying mm. people you know Palestinians or Arabs at this point in time um, you know need to let out their emotions because it's been a very long time not since October 7th but 75 years and longer before that. So I think in any way, shape or form, and I think a lot of people have been doing that. Obviously, there's the actions that you have seen, you know, the walkout, the trying to table the names of, um, you know, the people who have been uh, massacred, um, trying... Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So uh, you mean tabling the names? Yeah. yeah. So what I tried to do, I think, uh, in October, end of October, was try and... Because, you know, Labour and Liberals... It was for them, it was all about Israel defending itself. Um, there was such cowardice and um, heartlessness, is what I said, uh, about even acknowledging um, the, the murders of those in, uh, of Palestinians. So I decided to table the names of, uh, I think, at that point in time. And I just feel like horrible. It seems heartless as well to say at that time there were 11,000 people who had been killed. But I was even stopped from doing that. So uh, basically, Labour did not allow me to table the names of the people. Um, and and I, I just think, like, I struggle. I have to say, I really struggle um, to try and figure out the why. I mean, I know, in my, I know the why. The why is about, well, the why is about, like, so being tied to the US, you know, in, in our, you know, in our allyship with them in thinking that they will somehow help us when we need their help or, you know, the same kind of connections of <laughs> the, the colonialists. Um, other than that, there is no no other reason that I can think of, really. But that's not a good enough reason, obviously, at all, at all. That's no justification, never has been, never will be. We've got to break those ties as well. We've got to forge our own way forward in how we look at, you know, foreign policy or how we look at our connections with uh, various other people around the world, how we deal with injustices. But I tell you, when people say um, that Palestine is a litmus test for morality absolutely is like people get up in that chamber that I am in and talk about the human rights of literally everyone but not Palestine not Palestine so it is it really is and I think you know Albanese Penny Wong they've all failed that test totally and utterly failed that test how do we keep, so this, these were things we were doing to keep them accountable. You know, we demanded that they join the International Court of Justice case, but every time they have been pushing back. There's a group of people that stands outside Anthony Albanese's office every Thursday, and I've joined them many times, families for Palestine, um, you know, dads, mums, parents, um, you know, and the and children in Sydney. In Sydney. Uh, every Thursday they've been doing this for, for weeks and weeks. Anthony Albanese has not once come out, not once come and spoken to them. Like, like, what kind of democracy is this? You know, we take pride in, you know, a democratic nation, but what kind of democracy is that when you can't even come out and talk to people? You know, like we talk to people who, don't, who might disagree with us, you know, all the time. This is how you move the debate forward. So, you know, so... These things have been done when, like yesterday, I think Jordan Steele John called for the sanction of Netanyahu in the war cabinet. Uh, we've uh, kind of called for breaking um, military ties. Um, but if you ask me, 
and this is my kind of position, is that we've seriously got to start thinking about what Australia did during the South African apartheid under many prime ministers and for years, which is a full boycott of Israel. You know, a trade boycott, a, a military boycott, a cultural boycott. Like, this is an apartheid state which is committing genocide. Like, what more is needed for us to be able to push for that? Mm. Can I ask, like... Mm. Because there's obviously been calls for a long time that boycott, divestment, sanctions movement has been around for years now. Um, uh, is the Greens' official position to support boycott and, and divestment and sanctions of Israel? Or, like, where's the party sit on that at the moment? And if we aren't actively calling for boycotts yet, why, why not? So there was a lot of hard work done within the party, and I think it was last year when we came up with a new resolution on, on Israel and Palestine, which does clearly say that that is something that we should look at. But I think we haven't yet come to a decision on what that actually looks like, right? There are many ways, like sanctions, we've said, you know, Netanyahu, whole war cabinet should be sanctioned. We have said, let's break ties uh, with military. But like for me, it needs to go beyond just breaking military ties, to be frank. Like, and many people, like discussions I've had within the Greens, um, you know, agree, some don't. So I think we, we will have that debate very soon. And if people have um, any ideas on that, please feel free to air them today. And I will take them to the party. This makes me think about, like, I'm thinking about the cold, hard realities of electoralism where uh, we're always uh, doing that weighing up exercise of over here are the issues we want to talk about and we want to emphasize and draw more attention to. And over here are the issues that we think are going to win votes. And sometimes um, those two line up. And, you know, right now, Greens are winning a lot of votes on housing policy. And that's something that we actually, we really think is important. And we want um, to be talking about that. So it's kind of easy to occupy that space. And for a long time, say climate wasn't really an issue that was winning us many votes. And we had to just keep talking about it and make it into an issue that became a vote swinging issue. And um, Interestingly, like Palestine now maybe is just begin like there are a lot of Labour and even Liberal supporters who are swinging to the Greens over the Palestinian what's happening there. And, and uh, we don't we haven't really had an election in the last couple of weeks to really test that. I'll be interested to see what happens in the next couple of election cycles, whether there are a lot of people who swing to the Greens because of our better position um, compared to the major parties. But then there are other issues like, as we were touching on before, the treatment of migrant workers, uh, you know, obviously the ongoing oppression of refugees and, and the fact that even for skilled migrants, it can be really hard to get your family members over here. These aren't necessarily seen as vote winning issues because they're a party like a lot of these people aren't eligible to vote, right? Like I know entire families of asylum seekers who've been living in the community for a decade who work here, they pay taxes, all that sort of stuff. They're part of our community, but they've got no pathway to citizenship and the Labor government is still saying, no, 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 we want these people to go back to where they came from. That's the official line. And even though it's not safe for them to return, so the government's like, they can't become citizens, they're not going to settle here, even though it's not safe for them to go back. Um, but we in the Greens sometimes don't talk as much about those issues because it's not politically popular to do so. And I, I'm interested in your reflections on how do we thread that line? Uh, are we getting the balance right at the moment? Should we be talking about this sort of stuff, uh, particularly at the moment, right, where immigrants are even being blamed for the housing crisis? It's very tempting to be silent on that and be like, okay, we're just going to not talk too much about that. And it's like maybe what we should be saying is that every time – a politician or a spokesperson says, well, the reason the reason house prices are so expensive is immigration. When we know the reason house prices are expensive is because housing is treated as a way to make profit. Every time someone says that, should, shouldn't the Greens be saying, hey, that's racist. You're blaming immigrants for a problem of capitalism. But we don't because we don't want to get into that turf. Sorry, a lot of questions there. No, no, no. Um, you know, some of us actually do say that every time they say it. But I think, I do, I do. But I think one of the keys to this is why this isn't talked about, um, you, know, you know, in parliaments or even in by by us is because... To be really frank, neither parliaments nor the Greens are representative of the streets and suburbs of this country. Mm. Um, so that is like, you know, like I would not be with any single party. Uh, I love my party. I, you know, I love my members and my colleagues. But 
we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. And that is one, that is just one reason why representation matters. Um, and, you know, the, I guess the most, the worst example of how people who don't vote are, um, are treated was COVID, during COVID. If you remember, the only group of people who lost out on any support was international students and migrant workers. Everyone else got jobs. Seeking. Everyone else got something. We even pushed hard and we got students something as well, but we could not budge. The government would not budge on those. Um, also, you know, the whole the public housing kind of, you know, lockdown in Melbourne, you might remember that. It was mainly people of colour who were treated so badly in Western Sydney, the over-policing. Um, so it's very easily governments get away uh, with this because they don't face repercussions. Mm. And if I've learned one thing about the Labour Party, and I tried to push that back for many, many years because I did not want to believe that, you know, politics can be this cutthroat. But it is, they just care about the votes. And I'd never want to become that party that just cares about electoral politics. You know, there are, and, and the one reason why I joined and stayed on with the Greens was because we did, we did bring issues to the fore which, you know, may or may not impact our vote, like re refugees and people who seek asylum is one of those issues. Um, and, you know, I know many of the Greens will say um, they joined the party after the Tampa affair because they saw the Greens as the only people who were kind of, you know, pushing the, the kind of humanity. Uh, the reason to do this is because it is just and it is right. Um, so, yeah, so for me, I, I never, ever want to be that party. Obviously, we are a political party, so we are strategic and, you know, we do all of that. But also, like, if you look back historically on how our kind of vote has gone up, how our representation has gone up, it has been years and years of work, working with communities on issues that communities care about. It is not picking an issue which we think will get us the votes in the end. I, I just don't think that we can ever do that. We can ever do that. Sometimes, as you said, they align, and that's fantastic. But again, we are here to put the issues that no one else will put on the political or the public agenda, not to, to follow where the votes are. Uh, and, you know, the one thing that Palestinian allies and, um, you know, Palestinians and communities are saying to me now is that why the Labour Party is getting away with this without, you know, with being complicit, not just, you know, not just complicit, they're actually aiding and abetting Israel, frankly. They're aiding and abetting this genocide mm. is because they know that they will not face repercussions. Mm. So, you know, what I'm hearing from communities is that we cannot forget come 12 months or whenever, you know, because they also know that elections matter, that votes matter. So I think people are quite seriously thinking about how to hold Labour accountable to what they are doing right now. But it is sad that the only opportunity that we have in this country is, you know, election times yeah, to, yeah. for accountability. In between that, you can go ahead and do whatever you like and literally no one can do anything about it. Can I just, I mean, on that note, because I was struck recently where Australia basically bomb, helped bomb um, the Houthis, right? And And like... You know, that's an act of war where Australia has said, okay, we're going to start a new military action here without any real conversation. And yeah, anyway, we don't really have time to un unpack that one. Um, I think it's probably a good time for me to bring Quintessa up, who's going to maybe put a few, pose a few questions to ask, but also facilitate a Q&A from the audience. So if anyone else has got a question for Maureen or me, feel free to, yeah, stick your hand up. But over to you, Quintessa. That was really fascinating. Um, thank you both for your insight into that. I think um, from my perspective, I think my family as well. Um, so I'm a migrant. I moved here when I was 14. So it was really fascinating to hear your story about being an engineer because my dad is an engineer as well and he couldn't find a job. Um, and yeah, he was like stuck to doing like warehousing kind of work. And it was, you know, like for um, a lot of us were very proud of that education we put into um, getting to those places and then you come to another country where you're like, this is the land of opportunity and then you're stuck doing like very, like what's seen back in the country, like work that like uneducated people do. So, Yeah, so it, it's very embarrassing and you kind of like lose your status, you lose your sense of person and it's very frustrating that, you know, it's kind of like that perpetuating of, 
colonization. So it's really fascinating to hear that. But I guess my question was to you, Maureen, um, working within this system, like how has that like impacted your politics? Does does it make you um, even more like enraged and want to fight harder or has it sort of um, softened you a little bit to, to understand how you have to like work within these systems that are just so oppressive to move with in and amongst, especially as a woman of color? Very interesting question. (laughs) Um, So I guess I had a 25 year career before as an engineer um, in local government in consulting um, and as an academic before I somehow found myself in politics because it like it, I could not ever imagine, the thought hadn't even crossed my mind, to be frank, because there was literally no one like me in politics. I was the first Muslim woman ever to be in any parliament in Australia. So it, it ne- even when I joined the Greens, it was more to do with, you know, kind of campaigning and activism and helping other candidates. And, you know, one thing led to the other. And there I was. So I, I didn't know politics. I, I'm, I, I call myself an outsider in so many ways, like I'm a migrant, I'm a Muslim, I'm an engineer. I didn't come through, you know, student politics or knowing, I didn't, knew no one. Literally when my husband and I and one-year-old son came here, we knew no one, no one. Um, so, you know, you know, I guess kudos to the Greens for, you know, supporting me through, through, uh, through that journey. Um, but the one thing, so I didn't know politics that well in a sense, like parliamentary politics. Politics I knew because growing up in Pakistan, everyone talks politics. It impacts your day-to-day life, like everyone. We were just talking about it earlier, right? Um, you know, you talk politics to the person selling samosas on the street. You talk politics to, um, you know, when you go to uh, the beauty parlor to have your eyebrows done. You just, it's like everyone talks politics all the time. So I was quite surprised when I came here and people really didn't want to. Uh, and uh, I thought long and hard, for years later, why, but that's the whole other story. Um, But the one thing I was sure of was that I was there to do something different, to make it easier for others like me, uh, to be able to open that door for others like me so that we could finally, or we can finally have a parliament that is representative. So I think to answer your question, I've become more more intense, if I can call you that. I'm not at all, like, I don't want to be, like, no one sees me as the par- part of that machine anyway. Like, even now, people think, you know, this whatever crazy woman <laughs> who talks about racism and, you know, talks about, you know, Palestine in, in such a like, a, 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 like an open, tells, like, tells it like it is. So my resolve to tell it like it is has only strengthened in, in that time. I mean, I grew up with uh, poets like, I don't know if you heard of Fez Ahmed Fez, who was, um, you know, in the Communist Party. Yeah, there you go. There's someone who knows that Communist Party in Pakistan who was imprisoned for a very long time um, and who just did not let up. And I recited one of his poems in my first speech to the Senate, which is about um, speaking out no matter what, no matter what the circumstances are, because your tongue is your own, your body is your own, you have control over it and, and you've got to use it. You've got to use it. And he spoke about, you know, South Africa, apartheid. He spoke about the rights of Palestinians. So th- th- those were the influence kind of on me. And for me, there is no point. There is no point in occupying a position which only 76 people in Australia occupy if, if I don't use it to, to, to tell the truth. I, yeah, there are lots of repercussions. A lot of others would get away with saying what I say, possibly, but I don't, I don't. There's, you know, there's the right-wing media, there's other, like colleagues, not Greens, but other colleagues in in Parliament who just want, you know, there's gaslighting all the time. Um, there's racism, there's death threats, there's hate. Um, so I guess it's tough, it's not easy, but then I'm not there to have an easy time. That's not why I'm there. So yeah, I'm, I, I'm Just, I'll keep going. The fire is burning brighter. And I think when that fire isn't burning anymore, then you should leave. You you really should leave. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. And I think one last question to Jono before I hand over to the audience, if I can. Um, How how do you think the systems of colonialism 
like work at the council level? Like how does that and how, what's been your experience being, you know, a councillor working within those systems? Because um, like at your launch party, you, you talked about like pledging money towards First Nations people and trying to use council funds actually to empower First Nations people, which is something... Ca- council has never even like you know thought about and you can imagine in a basically fully white um council like that's not something that they're even going to think about and you know the, the Murdoch media went ham on that um and it was very interesting to see but yeah what what has been your experience that's a really good question and there's a lot of layers that I try to keep it concise um one thing that I'm struck by is just that the council plays a big role in shaping norms and values and what we pay attention to. And it was really interesting after the October 7 attacks, very quickly, Adrian Schrinner came out and said, oh, this terrorist attack is terrible. And they lit up the bridges and all the Brisbane landmarks, blue and white in the Israeli flag colours. And he was expressing this really strong solidarity with Israel. I think he probably gets to claim credit for starting I Stand With Israel trending in Brisbane. Like he was the first one to really start pushing that as a big as a public figure. And so as the mayor and the local council, these institutions are shaping the values of the people in the city. You know, the mayor is not just there fixing potholes and collecting wheelie bins. The mayor is kind of telling people of Brisbane what to pay attention to and how to interpret these broader events and is also telling higher levels of government this is what the people of Brisbane believe. So when the mayor turns around and says, I stand with Israel, higher levels of government are like, okay, Brisbane stands with Israel because the mayor does. So it, I think on that level, the council and local government has a big impact on both shaping the values of the people who live in the city but also in telling higher levels of government what the city wants. And that's really important. But also at a more practical and material level, um, not that that's not practical, that's quite practical material as well. But um, when we think about colonialism in the Australian context, really it comes back in large part to the commodification and control of land, right? The Australian colonial project was about stealing land, carving it up, selling it off, privatizing it, turning it into a commodity. And Brisbane City Council is very directly complicit in that, right? Like every time there's a big old block of land that's subdivided and carved up into smaller lots and into the houses and units that we all live in, that's making it harder to return that land to First Nations people. Like, And so the council is this, is this very active agent in the dispossession of First Nations people and the laundering of stolen land and the on-selling of stolen land. So I think we don't really attend to that too much because we, yeah, like we think of, oh, the land theft is something that happened ages ago and now we're dealing with the consequences. But in a way, every time Brisbane City Council is approving a new development or is allowing developers to carve up and sell off blocks of land, that is re-inscribing the colonial logics onto the city. Um, But yeah, some of the ideas we've been talking about in in the city council campaign, as you touched on, Quintessa, one of the big ones is this idea of paying the rent and uh, recognising that Brisbane City Council by itself probably doesn't have capacity to reverse colonialism and rectify all injustices. But what the council could very easily do is say, okay, all these landowners or, you know, non-Indigenous landowners are currently paying rates to Brisbane City Council. We'll just take 1% of that rates revenue that we're currently collecting and give that directly to First Nations organisations, whether that's the Aboriginal Health Centre, Health Service, or the Indigenous Legal Service. One um, percent of rates revenue would work out to, um, I think, like thirteen million or so a year. Um, and council's annual budget is about four point four billion dollars, but we take about one point three billion dollars in rates revenue. So, if the council started even just one percent of that started giving that back to local organizations without strings attached. And I, we didn't touch on this earlier, but it's the same with foreign aid, right? We give this foreign aid money, but it's always got strings attached. And that's often government funding for First Nations Org says, we'll give you this money, but we're going to tell you how you have to spend it, which undermines Aboriginal sovereignty and autonomy. So it would be quite radical and powerful for Brisbane City Council to say, we're going to give this money to First Nations organisations and they can decide how they spend it. And that'll, that'll, those communities have robust structures. They've got boards and committees and all these, you know, they have to do their annual reports like everyone else. So there'll be structure around how that money's spent, but the decision will be made by those Aboriginal community organisations rather than by the non-Indigenous council. And I think that would be a really powerful first step 
A, because those orgs would suddenly have a lot more money to spend on local projects and services without waiting for state and federal funding cycles to renew themselves. But B, it would remind the people of Brisbane, oh yeah, this is an unresolved problem here. We um, we still haven't really rectified, you know, we're all lovely people and um, we aspire to home ownership and we don't really think on a day-to-day basis about whose land we're, we're living on and who who it was taken from and what we can do. And it's it's very hard for us as individuals to be like, oh, well, what do I do? I'm, I'm just one individual. But the council is a big enough entity that it could start coordinating things like this at a city-wide scale and get to the point where one day the council is responsible for helping organize and coordinate treaty discussions or localized negotiations with landowners in this area because it's very hard for state and federal institutions to how, hold those negotiations when First Nations people in different parts of Queensland have different needs and there's such diversity of the experiences of colonialism where Brisbane City Council is kind of the right-sized entity to say, okay, we're going to liaise directly with younger and terrible peoples and work out what is important here on the ground in the city. But yeah, lots more to say for that. I'll have to save it for another time. Um, any questions from the audience? Thank you. Um, I'd just uh, like to... Uh, tell a little story of what happened to me last week. I was door knocking for Quinn in Inaugura and a guy asked, the first question a guy asked me was, what's the Greens view about Palestine? And he said, after I'd given my answer, you've got our vote for him and his wife. So it's a, it is a real issue, Maureen. Do you think he was previously a Greens voter? I don't think he was. I don't think he was. Maureen, you were here two years ago and you had a profound effect on me. And you spoke at a meeting uh, before the federal election and you said that when you went door knocking, you had a little feeling of fluttering in your heart, a little bit of anxiety, and that gave me permission to feel the same. Adam said, you guys can win. And that had a profound effect on me too. Uh, because I then thought, boy, if our federal leader is saying that, we really can win. And so I got on my bike and worked as hard as I could. And by speaking at these things, you are having an effect on Palestine. So, and I'm very, very, very grateful for the work that's being done. When we ask in Parliament, what is the moral issue here? What is the human rights issue? Why are we doing this? All the questions you're asking. I am so grateful that you and Stephen... And, and all the other guys. We've had a bit of power in Queensland and we've used it to the best of our ability. Thank you very much for what you said to me anyway. Hello, um, I'm Rowena. I'm a Queensland Greens member. Um, so I wanted to just touch on the in industrial aid complex. Um, so I did a master's in communication for social change, which is the sort of reaction to the failures of the aid program. We did a big, we did a big session um, examining the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is one of the largest funders of aid um, around the world, particularly in what they call um, third world countries. You know, we want all the benefits of globalism, but we don't want to deal with it. Um, so I just wonder how you think that impacts this conversation, how we deal with the, you mentioned corporations, this is also, but it's more the philanthropy side of things. Spot on, you're spot on. And some of those organisations that are funded by the Gates are also operate um, in Australia. And one of the ways I deal with that is that they take a lot of politicians to Indonesia or other countries, you know, it's all like an amazing helping children, blah, blah. I refuse. Mm. I refuse to go. Like, because if we go, even if we think it's like, it's really great, um, you know, what they're doing is good. It's like, why are we providing legitimacy to these, co like, philanthropists, they're also corporations. Like, we know how much of the philanthropy actually comes back <laughs> to people, like, you know, they, they've hired and a lot of the money is actually spent in getting the whole operation happening and probably very little on the ground improving things. And as you said, it comes with strings attached. Absolutely. So, as it is with public services, if I can say that, that is becoming more and more an NGO, you know, like NGOs in Australia doing the work that governments should be doing. I mean, housing is one, for instance. Um, you know, like that's that's not the way things should happen. 
like services should be provided by governments, not by philanthropy. Like universities here, I know it's huge in the US how much money philanthropy give, philanthropists give to universities, but it is getting kind of more popular here. Uh, one of the reasons is that governments are not funding, but then, you know, are they not funding because they want it to be privatized? You know, it's so, yeah, absolutely. I think we've got to be really aware of that. And, and especially what you said, what are they demanding in return for giving that money or doing that service? Um, so, yeah, I mean, aid, we should talk about it more. It's a bugbear of mine. It really is. Because, you know, they don't even, like, even the projects are not decided. Like, they're not self-determined by the communities, right? It's what we think uh, we want. So it's, it's all, um, yeah, it's all a pretense um, in, in the name of national interest. Basically, we want to get what we want out of it. Not ne not to, um, you know, not what the communities really need. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. But that's the other thing, you know, our communities are saying at the moment, no more photo ops with MPs who have been complicit in Palestine. And I think that's incredible that we're getting to that stage. And you're absolutely right, Andrew. That's what I've been hearing on the ground as well. Really, people tell me all the time. And it is, it's, a, it's having a huge impact. I mean, people have been telling me that their families in Palestine have been watching our speeches in parliament wow. just for some hope. Because they're looking around the world and seeing who, who to kind of, who is giving them some hope that the world is actually going to do something or even say something. Mm. So I think it's important at so many levels that this, we really push hard and really push the boundaries on this. Hi, um, my name's Jody. I'm Waka Waka. I live in Brisbane. I'm a member of the Queensland Greens. I, I guess my question is sort of difficult for me to formulate, but it's something that I'm trying to think really deeply about. It's like, what is the actual thing that we want? So the, the Greens will say, we want everyone to have a house. We want, I think someone phrased it as like, we want everyone to have the things they need to live a good life. Some will hear phrases like closing the gap. So like making everyone have a comparable standard or at least minimum standards of living. What is the actual fix? How do you, like what, as all these things that's trying to like make things better broadly, doesn't seem to really touch the sides of like fixing colonialism. So like what, even very broadly, what should we, what, what is the goal? Like, what are we trying to achieve? You know what I mean? Like, Housing rights on stolen land is sort of like a, a good contradictory sort of thing to frame it around. What do the Greens want? We want systemic transformation. We want a complete reimagining of society, of what's working, of what doesn't work. And we want to do that in a way that isn't authoritarian or hierarchical. And what I mean by that is that it's not actually our place as like a couple of political candidates or elected reps to say this is our vision for the future but what we want is to create the space where everyone can have a meaningful say over what what direction society should head in so like i you know i want um to to be honest i want to abolish the settler colonial nation state and shift towards a confederacy of local anarchist self-governed com communitarian entities where we're all in relationship with first nations people and um we're governed according to indigenous principles of, like that's my long-term dream i don't think we're going to get there in a hurry but um i think it starts by recognizing that right now the parameters of debate and the the um, the offerings, you know, the the menu of things we're allowed to choose between, so limited. We're given so few choices in terms of uh, what can we call for, what can we even dare to imagine, that we don't even have the intellectual space to say, oh, this is this is the way forward. Um, so I, I hesitate to be too prescriptive and say this is exactly what we want. Like, obviously, we want everyone to have a home and we want to be living in sustainably in harmony with natural ecosystems and all that sort of stuff. Um, but really what we want is transformation and, and that's not tinkering around the edges. That is fundamentally restructuring society in such a way that um, everyone gets a meaningful say and not just every human being, but that we actually consider the needs of future generations and of the non-human as well. But how about you, Maureen? Yes, I, I think I, I agree with you, but I think I want more than just here where we live. I, I, I see it as a global kind of... Um, quest you know not that just people who live here live a good life but everyone across the world like the, the anti-colonization project 
is not just for here. It is, for, you know, for for the, across the world. You know, like these arbitrary borders that were drawn by colonialists many years ago were drawn for a reason, right? To uh, divide and rule, to keep some, like in the global south, always oppressed. Um, so I think we've got to look at it in that way. But we all agree, I think mostly, because we have developed these ideas over years with members and supporters, what the end might look like. But for me, the means to get to that end really matter. And I gave one example of the energy systems. We know where we want to get to, but I don't think we've had much discussion on how do we get there by changing the system, not using what the boundaries we are in at the moment to get there. So for me, it is really about, I find that we, are, we quite easily conceptualize what a better life looks like, but it is hard of, we still talk about a better life in the same frame and the same system. So for me, when I talk about representation matters, of course we need to change the faces in parliament, but we also need to change how parliaments are run, um, you know, what they do, who actually, changing the faces doesn't mean that those more diverse faces get an equal say or have the same um, you know, voice that others do. It does not at all. So it is, I think, it is about yeah, changing. This. And th those are much harder, harder questions to answer. And I don't think we've nearly given enough debate and discussion to that. And I think we should start doing that now because, yeah, well, without that, we'll just be tinkering around the edges, frankly. I have a pretty simple question. How do you feel about the under-representation of certain humanitarian crises, global humanitarian crises, such as the Central African Wars, the Belarusian refugee crisis, North Ethiopian Civil War and the Myanmar crisis in Australian national and Australian international media and what that means for gathering support for these crises within Australia. And that is a really good question. And although we engage with the, you know, the diaspora here who, are, you know, whose families and who themselves, you know, are part and parcel of these crises, um, I think, yeah, absolutely, you're right. There's not enough attention on them. I think the one thing with Palestine that has happened and, and many speakers at the rallies and many Palestinians have again and again talked about the linkage between you know, like the, the issue of Palestine is not just the issue of Palestine, that it is a, like a symbol, if you can say, of what is happening around the world and how imperialism and colonialism is impacting so many across the world. And it has been a challenge, even with this crisis, when the world is watching for the media to actually talk about it, right? So uh, I feel it's like a huge challenge on how to talk about those individual crises. I do think, or crises, that we, we do need to find better ways of, like the discussion today on imperialism and colonialism is a way to kind of look at those linkages and what's happening around the world. And, and I feel that that's the way to talk about it. And we, you are right, we probably should talk about, um, like we should talk about those more as well when we talk about imperialism and colonialism and, and link those to the way um, the global north has actually, is, you know, empowered um, to, to, I mean, some of them, no one even mentions, right? No one even mentions um, because Again, I think it's the dehumanization of those people and that dehumanization does come from the superiority of, you know, of certain people over others. Yeah. Yeah, I, it, I mean, good question. It just made me think about how, like in 2009, um, towards the end of the Sri Lankan Civil War, I think the best estimates said around 80,000 Tamils were massacred by the Sinhalese government. Like it was, it was terrible. And I think Bob Brown spoke about it in Parliament at the time, but it, it did not generate anywhere near the same level of global outrage and concern as what's happening in Palestine is at the moment. And I guess that's really striking. And I, I, I think one of the main reasons for that is just that Israel is a much closer military ally and, um, the, you know, the US and Australia are more directly involved in what's like, it's not like that we're not involved in what's happening in Central Africa, but, um, there's those more direct connections there. And it's like, it's one of our own allies that's massacring people. Um, but I mean, the Australian government had close uh, relationships with the Sri Lankan government at the time of the civil war and was colluding with the Sri Lankan government to turn back refugees and all that sort of stuff. So it's, 
yeah, it, it is striking to me that the Palestinian struggle has resonated and gained that widespread attention in the way that others weren't. And I guess that does create an obligation for all of us to say to all these people who are new to this space, oh, if you're concerned about Palestine, did you know that this and this and this and this are also happening and these are all connected and we should stop thinking about these as siloed I- issues and recognise that there are these threads of colonialism, colonialism and imperialism that go back for centuries and that's really what's created so many of these conflicts um i hate to truncate my answer on this because it's such a good question but it's almost three o'clock and i think we need to let people have a break and get some cold water um i did just want to say though like it's freaking awesome hearing from marine but it also just makes me really excited about the possibility of getting quintessa elected and how cool it would be to have more women of color in our political landscape and marine made the very good point that um even within the Greens, we don't yet have very good representation of people of colour within the parliament. Like, Marine's our deputy leader, and that's amazing. But um, when you look at the party room at both the state level and the federal level, it's still heavily dominated by Anglo-Australians. And even at the local council level, we've got um, Trina Massey's our Gabba Ward ca- councillor, and we've got one or two um, people of colour running in key seats. But the vast majority of our local government candidates are, are white Australian as well. And so... Um, historically in other states, local government has been a pathway for Greens members to, they start out at the local level and later they become state and federal MPs. So if we're not getting more people of colour elected at local councils here, there's not going to be a good pathway to get more people of colour in at state and federal levels either. So I'm really glad that you're running Quintessa and I'm excited that, um, yeah, we've been able to share this space today, but can we please thank Maureen Faruqi for her time and her great work as the leader of the deputy, deputy leader of the Greens. Thanks Maureen. Absolute, absolute pleasure and such a privilege to be here with all of you. And can I echo what um, John has said about Quintessa? We need you, Quintessa, to please, you know, support uh, Quintessa's campaign and donate and don't knock, Andrew, go for it. <laughs> do whatever we have to do to get both Quintessa and Jono. I'm as excited about Jono running as mayor. Imagine um, Brisbane with Jono as the mayor. Oh my God. And Quintessa is one of the councillors and Trina and others. Incredible. Brisbane will change <laughs> for good. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Yeah. Wait, one, two, three, Anogra. Anogra! One, two, three, Quintessa. Quintessa! Quintessa! One, two, one, two three, <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks,